let's check out our room here. I'm just going to get going so we can be timely. I'm Natalie Fotis. I'm one of the uh, leaders of ComNet Detroit. If you're new to the group, I'll tell you what that is in just a minute. But I wanted to um, give an opportunity for my other ComNet uh, leaders to just give a quick wave. We've got Krista Yankee from the Kresge Foundation. Um, let's see. It, has Jack joined us? We've got quite a few people here, so it's hard for me to scroll through. But um, Jack from Three Spot, Emily from Fair Food Network, and Chiara from the Area Agents, <clears throat> Aging Agency. And we are ComNet Detroit. So if you're new to ComNet, Communications Network is a national organization. It's a peer-driven collegial community of foundation and nonprofit communication professionals who share ideas, evidence, and lessons about how smart communications can improve lives. The Com Communications Network helps members build relationship skills and confidence to navigate a shifting information landscape and to be a voice for change that benefits individuals and society. Um, those of us that have been in uh, Com Network Detroit, we banded together about two years ago to restart uh, local chapters. We meet once a month and uh, non-pandemic times, we do these in person on a steady cadence of um, you know, a Friday morning once a month but everything's up in the air right now. And so we roll with it once a month, choosing um, our, our date and time around what we think is best for your schedules and for our speakers. Every month we have a different speaker or panel of speakers and a different topic. If you have ideas for our topics, we would love to hear them. You can use the chat function here. You can also join our Facebook page if you go to Facebook and just look up Com Network Detroit, you will find us. Um, we'd love to connect with you there. It's also a great place to um, put questions and job opportunities. Um, we have an email list as well, uh, MailChimp. So for those of you who this is your first time registering, I'm going to reach out to you after this to see if you'd like to be included in our email list. Um, Thank you. My, my son's trying to get my attention, so that's exciting. But uh, I, I wanted to mention what's even more exciting is that Communications Network has been working for two years on a really big project, and it launches tomorrow. So it launches tomorrow, Thursday, December 17th, and it's a report on the state of comms for good. It's a diversity, equity, and inclusion project that has case studies, resources, practical tools that can help you and your organization bring the values and the principles of diversity, equity, inclusion into your daily work and your operations. So that was a lot of talking. I would love um, to get to know all of you. If you could drop in the chat your name, you wanna include your organization, and what I really want to know is your earliest career ambition. So at Skillman Foundation, we love um, doing these fun icebreakers. And as I was thinking about today's, I thought about the first thing I wanted to be when I grew up was Amy Saka, get ready for this, a cat photographer. So I would put silk scarves on my cats and take pictures of them. Um, Maybe I'll bring that back up if Amy uh, is kind enough to give me some tips today. But I would love to know what your earliest uh, career ambition was. Um, but I will also jump into today's uh, session. So visual communications. Most of us, when we think of communications, we think of words and much of our time as communicators is taken up by writing, whether it's social media, website copy, press releases, talking points, scripts, invitations, 
Um, thankfully, there's a lot of resources and thought leadership to help us make really careful decisions about the words we choose and, and, and how we structure our communications. You can find some of those exceptional sources on Communications Network website. But I think for me, what doesn't get elevated as often is the importance of visual communications, the photos we use, the fonts, the colors, the textures, and what those communicate to people. Um, and in events, the visual experience that um, our event guests have can in, in so little time that you're trying to motivate them to really care and connect to your cause. So as I thought about today, um, I thought about, you know, graphic design, photography, and events as these three buckets. And in thinking of those immediately at the top of my mind, I thought of Andy Kopietz, who leads Good Done Daily. Um, I thought of Melinda Anderson and her work in event design and Amy Saka, a world-renowned Detroit-based photographer. Um, I'll get a little more into their profiles and we'll launch into meeting them, but I just wanted to kind of ground our, our conversation. Um, you know, I, I think all of us are very aware of how hardwired people are to respond to imagery, um, but even though we like know that and we know how much weight our, our images and our design and our, our um, visual experience, uh, the weight that it holds, it's often kind of this like last layer that gets put on our communications. So I really wanted to talk to these folks to help me and, and to help all of us think about how we should be thinking about design very early in our strategies how we might be able to you know, work with experts in this area as we're coming up with our ideas and just for them to have an opportunity to talk to us about where their head is at and, and what they've realized in their craft um, are the most important takeaways that they you know, instill in their daily work. So I'm going to launch into our chat here how I've structured it is I'm going to go one panelist at a time. We'll ask a few questions and then we'll move to the next, but I'm gonna keep my eye in the chat here. So if you have questions as we go, I'd love for this to be as conversational as possible. You can pop them in there. If your question doesn't get addressed, again, you'll have a chance to go to the breakout room and, and, and touch on it there, but we will do our best to get everyone's questions answered here. So we're going to start with Mr. Andy Kopietz of Good Done Daily. He is the principal of Good Done Daily. He collaborates with philanthropic organizations such as the Skillman Foundation, nonprofit, cultural, and civic organizations throughout Detroit and Southeast Michigan to advance their social missions with visual communications. So Andy, as someone who lives and breathes design and has a really strong interest in advancing social change, how do you see the intersections of those two things? How can design support a social mission? Uh, thanks, Natalie, for the intro. Um, it's, by the way, it's really nice to be here. Natalie and I work together often and over the years, so um, I appreciate her support in, in putting this event together. To answer the question, um, I put some thought into this. I was, Natalie was kind enough to kind of give some cursory hints as to what she would be asking. And at first I wasn't really sure how to answer the question because uh, it's a little bit complicated and I could go in a lot of different directions. So I'm gonna just boil it down into maybe two ways that personally are, are working for me. So design as a practice can support social missions in like two ways. Uh, the first way I think is by elevating marginalized voices. So the people with the least power whose stories or independence and mobilities can be negatively or positively impacted by the way that we shape messages. Um, so for design to be effective, it should be respectful of those people whose lived experiences help to filter and shape the potential for design to even happen. And that kind of means that designers should never just gallop into a community or a project without context or 
understanding. And this is sometimes a problem that I see a lot with design practices that are early on in their career and, and figuring out what they want to do and how they want to work with leaders. And this, the second way that I think that design can do this is by adopting a no harm policy when you're invited into a project um, that's led by a group of morally aligned leaders. This really goes, this is really, this really applies to every project opportunity, but I think especially um, socially focused projects that are for cause forward organizations. This means truly building common ground and understanding uh, you know, in allyship with people who have long fought against systemic injustices. I've noticed that graphic design for the sake of itself isn't really enough. You have to understand the emotional forces and yeah, even the dicey social politics that underpin your client's work. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's not even about pretty graphic design deliverables. Sometimes it's about supporting uh, the expertise that's already there instead of operating as as though you, the designer, have all the answers. Designers need to be humble enough to step back from their computers uh, and realize that success of a project or a cause forward organization doesn't live or die by a couple of mouse clicks in Photoshop. And design by itself isn't going to change the world, um, but people will. So your work, just like your ideas, has to be nimble um, and egalitarian. Design should make sure Designers should make sure that they equip people to be self-sufficient stewards of whatever work they leave behind. So uh, those people should be able to completely own the work when you step back from the situation. And that's how I kind of see the intersection of design and, and um, you know, social communication for, for mission-driven orgs. Thank you, Andy. Very beautifully said. Um, so color, font, layout, all these visual cues evoke cognitive and emotional reactions. Can you show us some examples of this and point out some considerations for us to be aware of? Yeah, um, I thought about this and, and kind of plucked a couple of projects out of our, our body of work that I might be able to share that speaks to some of these themes. So what I'm gonna do is uh, share my desktop and project my screen so if you give me a second here, um, let me do that. And when I do that, the faces on my screen might go away. So you'll just have to let me know if everything works. Um, share. Okay. Okay. So um, some of this, I'm going to, I'll try to be brief, but I'm going to show you a little bit about how the sausage is made. And I've, picked a few examples. Um, the first is Skillman Foundation, which, is, which Natalie knows very well because she works there. Um, and the last two are the City of Detroit uh, and Atlantic Impact. These are three of our clients that we've done work uh, for. And um, the themes that Natalie mentioned, we kind of touch upon all of these things in our work. Uh, so, um, so the first thing is layout. Um, you know, and so this is an example of a Google document. And what I'm going to talk about is a report that Natalie and I just spent several months working on together um, that is looking at the legacy of the foundation's work and what they've done over the last 60 years. And so this, uh, out of context, is really the first part of how we set up the layout. We're not just starting by going into a computer and, and putting things down on a page. Um, for this, particular example, I commissioned a cover illustrator to work with us uh, to convey a theme. And I never just, um, when I'm trying to convey and understand and visualize the layout in my head, I never just sit down and start doing things. If I'm going to collaborate, I come up with a bunch of ideas and I kind of set the stage and the framework for what I want to see visualized. So I'm not just depending on people for their skills, but I'm giving them thoughtful uh, direction to get them to a conclusion. And so this is an example of a lot of the work that I put in at the front end just to develop something um, maybe as simple as a cover illustration. And so they get all of this feedback. And um, what, I, what I was really zeroing in on was the work that the foundation is doing and the ways in which their grant making and their program, programming initiatives touch the different spectrums of youth that they help. Um, on different paths, you know, from early education to, um, you know, self-sufficiency later on in life in higher education. And these themes started to emerge. It was, you know, art, sports, academic, music. These are things that a lot of the youth that pass through Skillman tend to be 
um, involved with, and it's through Skillman's influence that they are really able to engage with these things. So, um, you know, working with the illustrator, how do we visualize these concepts uh, and emotively call out to them? And so what we come up with are these three loose sketches that really um, hone in on these themes a little bit and how can we represent them? And so, um, you know, you're not meant to read all of this gobbledygook on the side. These are notes that we shared with Natalie and her team while we were working through the process. But what we ended up selecting was number two because it had this nice balance of, of kind of a human quality, but also a diversity of perspectives at, at play. Um, and so uh, just zooming in on this, you get a little bit of detail where all of these themes sort of coalesce and come together. And then it goes from this, uh, into the final form, uh, which we think became this really lovely cover that accentuates the legacy of the work that Skillman has been a part of um, and uh, you know, is diverse. And so that's another mistake that I see. I see a lot of nonprofit communications not adequately considering their audiences. We know that in Detroit, it's 84% you know, Black City. A lot of the work that the Skillman Foundation touches happens to be kids who are in the Detroit public school system. And so through simple gestures like skin tone and, call, and, and the differences of topics that they touch to their grant making, we tried to bring all of that together in a very thoughtful way. So it's really um, inclusive of the audience and the families that this report is kind of talking about. Um, so the next thing I'm gonna show you, uh, again, another bit of layout. This is for the city of Detroit. So this is an exhibition that we designed that talks about vacant land use. And anytime we're dealing with a lot of data and visuals, um, it gets really overwhelming quickly. And so um, what we like to do with clients is, again, step back from the computer and not start there as a lot of designers are tempted to do and think about what we're doing in physical space. So we actually went to the client's offices when we could still do that. Um, and we set up uh, loose framework and sketches for the exhibition on the walls to get a sense of scale. Um, and this is what really helped us understand layout. So we're not, we're working in miniature on panels that are as big as four feet tall, but on your computer, your scale is all distorted. And so when you're thinking about layout, how do you represent information in all of these different sizes that people are supposed to walk up to and at a distance understand? Um, and so this is what it became. It's called a, a palimpsest of landscape strategies. And a palimpsest is like layers of topologies that are on top of each other. You might imagine peeling away um, tracing paper and revealing different layers. And so um, in the design of the key art that you see here, we've actually layered text on top of each other to reference this concept. Um, and again, we show layers of how the topologies of land in the city that are vacant could be activated. Uh, and this was uh, at the Chicago Cultural Art um, Center, I believe, for about a couple of months. So again, and one of the things that we wanted with the tone of this design was we wanted it to be very didactic. Like you needed to, it needed to be very clear and honest. It needed to convey information in an easy way. We didn't want to take away from it, be performative or distracting. It just needed to express data and visuals in a clear, straightforward way. And we weren't trying to show off. Um, and you know, even the color, uh, thinking about vacant land use and how the city is transforming in Detroit, it's always under construction in a way. And so we chose orange as a color that references this idea of caution or construction. It's a part of the visual landscape. It's something that we're all familiar with. When we're driving and we see construction cones, we know that something's, something is in progress. So even the colors are uh, a kind of subliminal cue for, towards that. And you get aspects of data and things like that. And the full space in the museum when you step away. Um, next, I'm gonna talk about color. Uh, so this is a project with the city of Detroit. It was uh, master transportation strategy and planning. And it was to uh, get people involved in the aspects of planning the, uh, the master plan because it hadn't been changed in over a hundred years. And so we were thinking a lot about the landscapes and the neighborhoods in Detroit and Detroit has this rich visual language and legacy of color murals, different colors in their architecture in different neighborhoods. And so we wanted to represent this in the communications. Um, and this is what we ended up with. Um, these are communications that are essentially mostly digital now because we're living in a digital world. 
but um, they're meant to, when people see them in social media or as PDFs or in emails or e-newsletters, to catch their attention, to draw them in. I've noticed in Detroit with civic communications in government, there's a lot of distrust with what's happening here. Not everybody trusts the government or what they're doing locally. And so when you take something that is supposed to be a city communication and you tilt it on its head by using color, you can actually draw people in and get them interested in something that maybe they would just ignore. And so color was a very intentionally used to like draw people in, but also be reflective of the, the streets and the things that the city is actively trying to make safer for pedestrians. And you get a sense of that um, in these posters. And then the last thing I'll talk about briefly is typography. So not, it's not topography like maps or the, the topology of land, but it's fonts. How do we use words to convey spirit and attitude and things like that? And so that's really what the act of typography is. It's the arrangement and compositions of words on the page in relationship to imagery and how we make something speak or convey a certain type of information to people. And this is for our client Atlantic Impact who take youth in the city of Detroit and globally experiential field trips to get them engaged outside of the country and to, to it really expands their worldview and it sometimes can encourage them to pursue ambitions into higher academia and like, you know, getting them further into life. And so um, they came to us and they wanted us to rebrand them. And we started looking at their logo and we noticed some themes that the paper airplane represents mobility and transport and sort of um, climbing, you know, climbing upward, you know, for into your future, but also felt kind of rigid. And this is a program for youth. And so there shouldn't be a lot of that rigidity. It should be a little bit more playful. And so we started to think about Atlantic Impact. Well, what is it? You've got an A for the name. Um, you've got this existing figure, which is the airplane, you know, this idea of flight or transformation or, or taking you someplace new. You've got this idea of academia and education. So how do we absorb information usually through books or literature. And then you've got this idea of the pencil, which is this common tool that we all use when we're in school to scribble notes in the margins of our pages and things. So when you put that together, uh, you get this kind of, you get this logo. And the way that typography exists in this is a little subliminal. You might see an A in the negative spaces of the symbol. You might see education. You might see something that represents flight and we've pointed it intentionally upward to represent that kind of upward incline or that achievement for kids. Um, and then similarly, when we were thinking about the visual language for this, it was shape, pattern, texture, uh, and collage. So this idea that people are traveling all over the world and they're putting together a collage of experiences that they've never had before. And how do you reference that in a cohesive visual way? And so we ended up with this. Uh, which is this, we hoped was this more dynamic way of representing youth in context to the work um, that the a nonprofit is doing, but also, um, you know, giving them something that's very attractive that draws them into the program that gets them engaged and also helps the nonprofit tell their story through these, these emotional cues. And so again, you see here um, the poster that unfolds and turns into a program guide, which then gets mailed out to a bunch of people. Uh, at schools across the Detroit public school system. And this is another uh, thing where I think typography is important. We tried typesetting words for different fonts in this and it just felt like it wasn't working. And so for it to inhabit that expressive style, we decided to just hand write it. And once we did that, that's when things really started to come together. So I think this is another example of how words create spirit and that spirit is what reaches out and touches people when they're engaging with communications. And this is the final slide, and then I'll shut up. Um, this is the way that we represented these, uh, these students and these people, and we wanted it to be very asset-based. So instead of focusing on the deficits of a Detroit public school student who's never been out of the city, focusing on people who are diverse and are, are happy about um, the opportunity to travel and are represented in a more positive light. Thank you, Andy. So that, now you, you can see and hear um, why I love working with Andy and wanted to make sure everyone got an introduction to him if you have not already um, met Andy. He is so thoughtful about the work that he does. Um, and the, the outcome of that is just so beautiful and stunning. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Andy. And now... Thanks. 
Thank you. I'm going to flip it to Amy Saka, who is a documentary photographer and who's very passionate about celebrating the beauty of people and culture, particularly in Detroit and the Midwest. Amy is a National Geographic Explorer, a two-time National Geographic grantee, and a top 50 critical mass photographer. If you haven't had a chance to check out her photography, please Google Amy Saka Photography and get ready to be blown away. You'll see so many of the faces of um, Detroit. Um, and uh, the thing that I love about her most is that in those faces, you get a real sense of who the person is. Um, she, she has such a, a repertoire and collection that you know she's meeting these people and capturing that spirit like within minutes and to see people like just melt, let their guard down, show who they are in a very real way is uncanny. So the, the thing I wanted to ask her most um, for all of us is Amy, how do you get people to let their guard down and be real in front of a camera? <laughs> Thank you so much, Natalie, for that introduction. That means so much to me. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Yeah, so it's really interesting. Um, I, you know, when I first started out in photography, I was kind of in, interested in landscapes and travel photography. And I, I just wanted to bring up the moment where I kind of had an insight about taking photos of people. I, I had the privilege of being in India and I saw this little girl playing by a stream and I had never taken pictures of people before. And she saw me and she came up to me and she started interacting with me. And I felt this electricity in the moment and I felt like, I don't know if anybody has heard of this term flow, where you kind of forget all of the sort of anxieties that you bring to a situation. Um, and it you feel like you're at your best. And I think it was because I was, I was hoping that she felt comfortable. She was excited to be in the situation. And and I realized that I was kind of, so I took her photo and I actually have her photo up uh, in my basement. This was, you know, 10, 15 years ago that I took this photo to remind me of that moment where I was like, there's a magic in this situation. And I started to follow that. And I noticed that whether I'm, so I've also been a copywriter for 20 years of my life. <laughs> and so I kind of like, taken photos for marketing purposes, but also um, for documentary projects. And I bring that up because no matter what situation I'm in or who I'm photographing, I always have that same experience when I encounter people that I, I get in this moment of flow. I, I'm so excited about it. And I think that's the first key to getting people to let their guard down is just like anything that you do, when you bring passion to a situation and a person can feel that, they open up. And what I'm passionate about is seeing the beauty in people. So I don't care what you look like or anything. I, if I'm in a situation with you where you're feeling beautiful, it comes out in the photo and that gets me so excited. And then it's sort of this reciprocal process, right? And the, the, the other person feels like, oh my God, somebody's appreciating me. And so for me, it's, it's really, really about that. And that's kind of, I will say that's an enthusiasm that's a little bit hard to manufacture, you know, like either you have it or you don't. <laughs> and, uh, and I do, and I'm blessed, you know, I guess I'm blessed with that gift. And so I feel like um, in photography, I'm able to kind of bring out the best in me, which is showing appreciation for other people. And then I think that's reflected in, you know, how the, how the photo turns out. People start to feel relaxed. I mean, everybody wants to hear you're beautiful. And that's, I mean it when I'm in that situation with people. 
I feel like getting my photo taken right now. <laughs> Amy, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, and I also think it's um, trying to find common ground with people. You know, oftentimes when I'm shooting for nonprofits, profits, for example, um, I'll be shooting um, teenagers who have been through like a really, you know, maybe like a tough time. And I, I will express my own vulnerabilities. Like if I'm talking to a teenager about making decisions and cut, like I will enter that discussion and I will say, you know, when I was in your age, I, it was tough for me too. Or I've, I feel uncomfortable behind a, a camera. And when they see that I, my goal is for the person to feel that I am on their level. I am not, sometimes when you enter a photography situation, the photographer might feel, there might be a feeling of power, I guess. And my goal in that situation is that the person really understands that I do not see myself as, I, I want us to see each other as humans. Um, and so I try to bring my, my story and my vulnerabilities and my insecurities, you know, I try to make it that obvious to the person so they see me as, hey, this is just a person who's trying to connect with me versus someone who's um, trying to get something from me that is difficult to, uh, you know, when somebody's nervous, it's difficult for them to bring that kind of authenticity if they feel like there's a power dynamic that, uh, you know, doesn't empower them. That That's very helpful. Um, I will try harder next time to definitely <laughs> make that connection. Making people feel at ease is something my grandfather was wonderful at. And I always admired that in him. So yeah, yeah. I think it's definitely a great quality to have um, for communicators on the whole too. Yeah. I, and like I said, the, the, the enthusiasm is, is the key. It's that who doesn't want to be around someone who's excited about life and excited about the situation you're in. And, and the person that you're photographing is the reason for it. Right. It's like, I get to spend time with you. How cool are you? Um, and for me, I don't care who it is. If it's somebody who's a CEO or, you know, a teenager or whomever, it's a privilege. I see it that way too. I see that it is, you are offering me your time, your, um, it's very vulnerable for somebody to be in front of the camera. That is, and I know because I blush in front of the camera, I get nervous and all that. So I know how nerve wracking it, it can be. And so I feel honored to see somebody in a position where they might feel vulnerable and CEOs are just as vulnerable as anybody else. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Some of the difficult, most difficult to photograph bankers too. Um, Amy, I know you have some photographs that you are willing to share with us. I would love for you yeah. to, to do that and to let us know what you wanted to share about those. Sure. So um, just as like a preamble to the photographs I'm showing, um, I've been working on a project. It's my own personal project. It's called My Fellow Americans, where I've been um, traveling around the U.S. Um, I've been following the footsteps of a photographer who did this project in the late 50s. Um, and he really is just kind of putting a lens on American life. And I just wanted to show these photos because I've, I've met a cross section of people from lots of different places. And I'll point out uh, the similarities in the photos as far as what I'm looking for. And I know this isn't, these aren't photos that are necessarily used in communications or anything, but it's, it's the same approach. Um, so yeah, I'll just, sh I'll share my screen. Can, can you see that? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> oh, okay. And, and that's okay. Now, now we see a black screen with a oh, little no. white hand. Resume share. Um, we see your screen, but it's a, a black box. 
Oh, that's that's really weird. Um, I don't know why that's not working. Can you see it now? No, it does not appear that you are screen sharing right now. So weird. Okay, I might not be able to put it at. Can oh, you? See there it is. Okay, yes. I'm not going to put it on full screen mode because okay. I think that screws us up here. So again, a lot of these uh, photos were taken as a part of this project. And what I'm looking for here when I chat with people is I'm just looking for a, a kind of sensitivity or something in their eyes that makes you feel like you can connect with the person. Um, and here, like, I, I also look for um, moments where the person, you can sense their feeling of pride and a confidence about them. Um, and even just a, a real authentic kind of here with a sense of, of joy. I, I try to use gestures a lot in my photos too. Um, because I like the way that different um, arm movements, for example, bring your eye to the person's face. Um, and, and a lot of these photos actually were very, how do I say it, collaborative in that I look to the people too, to when they're doing something and I notice it, I'll say, oh, this, that, that looks amazing. Let's do that again. And what do you think we, uh, we should do? And so I really just try to empower people and make it, make it a shared experience. And then I was gonna end on some, some more action oriented um, photos here. I think uh, when I'm not doing straight on portraits, I'd like to bring a lot of energy into a photo. This happens to be a really renowned photo uh, photographer in Detroit. Her name's Lenny Sinclair. And I, uh, I just happened to see this woman walking down the beach on Belle Isle. And I was like, she's amazing. I want her photo. And she put the towel over her head. And I said, oh, this is incredible. And then I started talking to her and she said, oh yeah, I'm Lenny Sinclair. And I said, oh, I, I know who you are for sure. So I was really lucky to get that photo. But yeah, I look for these moments where there's a lot of energy and um, you know, this woman here with a big smile. So it's a lot about uh, realizing moments of authenticity too. And I think some of that happens after the fact when I'm reviewing the photos, because I will take a lot of frames and then I'll, I'll look at each of them later. But, but most of my interactions last about five minutes. So it's pretty quick. That, that is incredible that you are able to capture moments like that um, in five minutes. Um, I thank you so much for all of your tips. I don't know if we're going to be able to reproduce this level of skill and intimacy, um, but darn. Wow, that's so beautiful. Thank you, Amy. Um, and I'm gonna turn it now to Melinda, who is the owner of Studio M Detroit. It's an event design and production studio that produces events for audiences of two to 20,000. She served as the creative director for Design Corps Detroit um, for eight years, planning and producing over 500 events in the city of Detroit during that time. Um, she has uh, executed experiential brand activations um, and produced events for local nonprofits such as CHAS Detroit, Detroit Institute of Arts, and the Charles H. Wright Museum. Um, so Melinda, I just wanted to start uh, with a question about event fundraisers as a lot of us in ComNet uh, Detroit are um, nonprofits that really rely when we can have in-person events on in-person events where we have such little time to grab people's attention to connect with donors and potential donors and to really like get them to understand what our mission is and get them to care about it in a way of sustained giving. Mm -hmm. So um, since it's, events are typically so short format, 
Um, how can event design be leveraged to tell the organization's um, story and to really make an impact? Sure. So thanks, Natalie. I think that first you really have to change your thinking a little bit that um, I feel like the event is the entree and leading up to the event, those are the appetizers. And so thinking of it that way, when we would produce events, Bravo Bravo for the um, Detroit Opera House, and then for the month of design, we had um, several appetizers that led up to the big entree. So with wanting to get um, the community to have fun with design and interact with design, we had an event called Drinks by Design. And it was a monthly networking event that took place in a different design studio um, every month. And it was, um, there were drinks obviously involved and we were able to showcase a lot of local talent because when we first started the month of design, we had 85 events that happened all over the city and it was just too overwhelming for people. So we really had to focus our efforts and use a year long strategy to make that big event even more impactful. And so we did that with the appetizer drinks by design and also with the opera house, you know, we found that Bravo Bravo started to overshadow the mission of the opera house and getting young professionals involved in the event. And, you know, that often happens a lot. So if you're feeling that, wow, you know, people come to our event, although a lot of people come to our event, um, we don't see an uptick in, um, you know, engagement and supporters. You really have to think about a year long strategy and what are the appetizers that will lead people to the big entree. And then once they're there, the event has to be very intentional and interactive. I love events that are fun and use design and art installations and oversized because you really have only a few minutes to catch their attention. And so I often work with photographers like Amy and Andy and graphic designers like Andy and incorporating a lot of that into the event because you know, these collaborations are key. You can easily say um, a lot, a picture is worth a thousand words. So you can easily say a lot with photos or quotes, ding, the entrance is key. I know you've got some images to share with us too. So I'd love for you to show us some of the work that you've done. And if you could point out like why this was a memorable um, uh, event piece for you. Sure. So, okay. Okay. So let's see. Okay. So this, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So on the right is a group. Um, they were called the Safety Shaman and they were our human wayfinding um, guides through Eastern Market After Dark because people often felt um, that they couldn't navigate through the event. The mission of Eastern Market After Dark was to um, showcase this district and also for it to be a really great experience for the retailers. And so this was a very fun event. We um, supported a local design group that um, created these oversized signs. And then we supported local talented creatives that were the performers. And so that was a really fun event and they were very popular, but um, you know, this is just a one way of, of really making it fun. And then this for uh, the DIA, this is Hot in Havana that um, I produced for them. And really starting to think through and telling your story through the floor plan. So when you first enter the event, there was a photographic moment, but it was just you know some little details that we try to pull into the event to make it more fun. And then instead of having a red carpet, we had a human carpet where you were greeted through the Romanesque hallway with um, African dancers that were trying to emulate um, this Cuban vibe. And instead of having, you know, I, I think that a lot of people in nonprofits and other events, and I've done it before, they have 
people check through registration and they have a step and repeat. Well, you need to kind of really save that and build the story and the excitement before you really just want people to um, take that photo. So I would recommend that taking the step and repeat is just, you know, probably the third way to impact folks. And then also simple lighting. Um, it's very inexpensive uh, to, to transform a space that people have been into uh, many times before. So just simple park hands and lighting um, is one of the ways to make an impact. Also custom furniture and um, collaborating with artists. On the left is an artist that we collaborated with to create custom imagery. And we also had a strong graphic designer that created the brand. And then we rented uh, furniture to really kind of transform the environment. But of course, nonprofits, you have a budget. So I would think of really bookending the experience, the entrance, appetizers leading into um, the, the bulk of the event and then a strong finish. So we did that through entertainment for this event. And then here's another example when, I was when I'm talking about being oversized and impactful. This was for the Walter P. Chrysler um, Museum years ago where the entrance, you know, we really wanted to bring that imagery to life and focus on why we were there. So I designed scrims work working with the graphic designer designing them for the entrance, but then also for the entrance to the theater, because behind the museum, we built a clear span uh, tent where Jay Leno was the host. He was our big closing entree for that event. And, um, you know, again, putting the scrim and the messaging, but again, what these, uh, you know, nonprofits did is that they had a year long strategy of getting people to the event and then after the event really engaging with them because the events go by so quickly. Uh, this is one designer I love, uh, David Stark in New York that creates these really huge fun and oversized moments and they have a lot of meaning. And then a lot of these, um, the event decor gets um, donated and disassembled to for a worthy cause. And then this is one of my favorites, um, the boom box that I built for movement. Um, it's 10 feet tall by 20 feet. And this is just something that was just so impactful and people from all over just really embraced that. And so that's what they, that was their first impression leading into the general admission um, entrance and that's where more of my work is going towards building large installations for events that have the impact and then working with uh, companies for a year long strategy. So Melinda, I think a lot, some people um, would look at some of these things and be like, okay, well, that's a huge budget. I'd love for you to share how you made that boom box. So actually that boom box costs $6,000. And because I can build things, I, um, you know, shopped around to get the sequins um, from a wholesaler and I really uh, got the best price and I cut deals. And so I um, did a lot of the um, design work and hands-on. And then my team, instead of going to a prop art studio, we built it with a team of volunteers because there, there are so many volunteers that come and they want to work for movement. And I think when I'm designing the VIP area, I put together um, decor ideas that volunteers can easily do. So I think through um, hiring local and talented carpenters and artists, that's how I was able to bring that in. Because I think something like that would cost a lot if you went to um, a prop art. Studio. I was so impressed of your um, coordination of volunteers and I spent uh, many years working in the nonprofit sector and we're always trying to think of, you know, how there's, there's people that want to help and what kind of projects, you know, can be meaningful. Um, and I think event decor um, for me wasn't something I thought of. So um, I thought it was really cool, you know, that people could be involved in that and feel like really good about the product they were able to create. Um, so as you can see in the chat, I completely um, 
underestimated the, the time our conversation would take us to. So breakout rooms are not going to happen for this session, but I would love um, for folks to um, put questions in the chat or pop, you know, pop them into conversation. I did see one about um, virtual events, uh, which we had a, another ComNet um, gathering on. But um, if any, if Melinda or anyone on the call, if you do have uh, suggestions for virtual event tips, I don't know if you've had um, much virtual event planning experience yet. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm reading through the chats. I was reading through the questions. So um, I did have one virtual experience this year where we produced an event for Quicken um, called Detroit Out Loud, and it took place in River Rouge Park. And early on, you know, the client, we had discussions, should we do it in person or should we not, uh, or do it all virtual? And so what we ended up happening, what we ended up coming up with is that we came up with a hybrid model. So um, we rented a studio space for me to build a lot of the set design and we utilize the display group. And I'm not sure if, you, if everyone on this call knows this, but the display group has pivoted their business during COVID to offer um, a sound stage. And what's great is that you can utilize their inventory. I've worked with them for 10, 15 years. So it was great, you know, going to pull stuff and then setting it up and doing these set designs. And then we would go out into the community and we would have days that were scheduled to do live interviews or tours or things like that. So I think that especially after COVID um, really subsides, I kind of hope that virtual events and hybrid events that that will still stick around a, a little bit. Thank you. I see a question from Jay Wall to Andy. Can you tell us about the integration of messaging, copywriting and graphic design? How does that usually work in your process? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question, Jay. Jay's a friend from Canada who's joining us, um, and he runs a really great design practice out of Toronto called Rally Rally that you should check out. Um, yeah, for me, I try to understand um, early on what are the concepts that we need to address through design. And then um, because we're not uh, people who typically write words or copy, um, we try to work with others in our sector who are more cause forward focused copywriters so they understand the kind of vulnerabilities of um, nonprofits with social missions and the intricacies of really getting into the details of that. Um, an example of that is a bit, a bit with Amy. Amy and I work up together a fair amount on that because she has a background in nonprofits but also in the commercial world with copywriting. So when I'm trying to kind of meld and uh, bring those things together, it's always early on sitting down at the table with the client perhaps even someone like Amy, and then thinking through tactically, uh, what are some ways that we can boil down or introduce a message into the, into the work? And then on the back end, once we have that information, Amy and I are, sometimes we might be sharing sketches back and forth where I'm thumbnailing things and saying, copy placement is gonna go here. We need to think tactically about how we're gonna fill in this space, but also um, zero in on the message. Sometimes Amy and I are working on copy development for websites, nonprofit websites. And it can be really helpful for Amy's process to see working wireframes of the pages because it gives her a sense of perspective in terms of where her copy is gonna fit and flow into the page and how the design itself might take cues from the copy. And if the design is taking cues from the copy, then the design is certainly being influenced by the way that the layout works and the way that words and images come together on a page. I don't know if that is a little bit meandering or if that, that made sense, but that's my answer for that. Great, I think this question can apply across the board. Um, when, so as on the client side, for if I'm working with a photographer, with an event designer or a graphic designer, how much of my guidance and direction is too much? Where am I crossing the line and actually stifling your ability to um, do the best product possible? Um, well, Melinda, I'm kind of curious from your perspective how you would answer that question because you're working with physical spaces and built environments, which 
seems a bit more tenuous than graphic design. And so I'm wondering how you would respond to that. Yeah, so I think it really depends on the clients. Like, so when I work with Paxahow, we've worked together for so long that I never really show them renderings, finished renderings. I always talk about the process and they give me feedback. They say, we like that direction or we don't like it. And then during um, the setup, you know, we set up for 14 days. So then they are able to come and, and check it out and give feedback. And there's a lot of Amazon um, sometimes <laughs> runs because I, have, I may have to change things. So I think that it really depends on the client. Some clients want to see the whole event set up and they want detailed renderings and they can give you a yes or no. Some people aren't that visual. So they need to see a detailed plan. And that's fine because if they, if I don't know what they're looking for, um, you know, and I can't, I'm new to working with them, I really need a little bit more. Um, sometimes clients put mood boards together and that's great for me. So I can really nail it. So it, it really depends, but um, sometimes it's tough because if I'm setting up for a couple of days when the client wants to come and see progress, you know, a lot of changes can then happen. Thank you so much for answering that. And I'm sure Andy thanks you too. I think he wants me to leave the room if he's gonna answer it, but <laughs> we have another um, question. <laughs> Do you wanna take it? Uh, no, well, I'll just, I'll say it like, I mean, Nat Natalie's really one of the, the unique situations that we have in this space. She's easy to work with. She, I think is collaborative and wants maybe different ideas, but um, I th actually think the more involvement, the better. And I think there's a lot of designers that wouldn't say that. Usually designers want to be over here in a silo. I actually don't think that's how effective communications work in the nonprofit or a cause forward space works. I think stakeholders have to be as involved as possible. And yeah, that gets a little bit messy, um, but the outcome is almost always more rich because you're um, building consensus and you end up in a space where people own those ideas and then they're able to take them forward even when you stop and step back from the process. Like people need to be able to own things and that buy-in at every stage is critical. So the more people you can involve, especially in executive leadership, the better. That That is great. and. Um... I just wanted to thank the panelists, Andy, Melinda, Amy, thank you so much. I think we could go on for the rest of the afternoon, um, but I will respect your time. And I thank you so much for giving us this insight. I, I do wanna acknowledge, we did have a question in the chat about um, uh, uh, infographic and, um, and design, I think that is probably going to deserve its own session in 2021. So we'll definitely, you know, put that on the list. If you have other ideas of sessions that you would like to see, speakers that you want to hear from, um, please uh, uh, send me an email. You'll get an email from me post this event to make sure if you want to be on our email list and are not already on there. Another way to contact us is through the Facebook group which is in this chat, or you can just go to Facebook and uh, search up Com Network Detroit. I wanna thank Kareem Alston, who is on the line from Communications Network Na National. Kareem set up this call for us and did the hard work of doing um, breakout groups. I'm sorry that I didn't use them, Kareem. I really do appreciate um, you putting in that effort, um, but our conversation was too rich to be siloed. So thanks everyone so much. And we look forward to having you at January's event. Information soon to come. Thanks everybody. I really appreciate it.